Hello out there, all my quarantine chess friends out there. I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about the F3 uh, variation in the Nimzo Indian defense. Uh, this takes place after d4, knight of 6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, and then white initiates this with f3, which is um, a really ambitious uh, choice for white. Uh, basically, white just wants to uh, play this move e4. Followed by e5, in some cases f4, f5, and using his huge pawn center uh, to basically take space away from black. Uh, starting, of course, with the e4 square and push black off the board and ending most of these games in the king side attack. That's basically what happens when everything uh, goes right. Uh, first, before I get into this uh, first uh, game, uh, um, please support my channel by uh, clicking on the links below. There's videos um, and the links uh, are related to this opening. Uh, and also, please support my channel via donation and clicking that thumbs up to help uh, move the videos up in the algorithm of YouTube so that they can be more visible to everyone. Thank you. This first game we're going to look at is like an example game, all right? Um, it's from 1940 between two unknown players, a player named uh, Rodell and Haberman. Uh, and this is just to show you what it looks like when things just go according to plan uh, for White. So here we go. Again, we're looking at it from White's perspective, and we're just going to look at a few uh, games, and we're going to go through them rapidly, okay? So we're going to start uh, here in 1940. So we have our F3 variation. D5, of course, trying to prevent E4 immediately. And White just plays A3 right away. In other words, he's willing to trade uh, with Black pawn structure for the Bishop pair. All right? Which is good compensation for White. Notice he gets open file, the B file to use, and he has the two pair of Bishops um, in exchange for his slightly compromised uh, pawn structure. Black plays c5, again trying to uh, pressure the white center and prevent this move e4 from coming so easily. This is one of the main lines. Of course, white can't really afford to play e4 at this moment, so he has to um, play e3 for now. Castles, c takes d5, e takes d5, and modern looking play. And... White just begins to develop uh, behind the pawns, all right, and akin to the Kali system, all right, with the pawns on e3 and c3, White has the same idea. It's basically to build up, right, all of this uh, kinetic or uh, rather potential energy behind this pawn chain, and then at the right time explode with this move e4, and again, sometimes e5, uh, and just... Um, Cause Black's pieces to be driven away uh, from their natural squares. And while there's disharmony in the Black position, launch a, a vicious kingside attack. So there are some similarities between this setup um, in F3, Nimzo, and the Kali system. Knight c6, knight e2, rook e8. Again, notice the main battle here is for e4, as in all variations of the Nimzo. Castle, and now c4. All right, this is a committal move because when you play uh, c4, you take some tension away from the uh, d4 square. As there is no longer an option to exchange here. And this gives white more of the impetus to play e4. So when you commit to a move like this, uh, c4, you better make sure that you are ready to stop the advance or at least make white pay for it. So bishop c2, b5. Um, Black is pursuing his traditional attack uh, on the king, uh, queen side. Knight g3. This is an uh, important maneuver uh, in many of these variations of the f3. Uh, Nimzo. Basically, white is going to support the e4 advance by bringing his knight here to g3. h5. Again, idea... For black is to play h4, knocking the knight away. 
So they're bat still battling, albeit indirectly, for e4. This is why white plays knight h1. The idea is to hop out at f2. And now the knight is unassailable at f2. And at the same time, he's still supporting the e4 advance. So a5, f4. I'm sorry, um, knight f2. Bishop d7. And now finally e4. So black is not able to stop it. So he continues along with his plan. B4, A takes, A takes. Rook takes, Queen takes. And now E5 uh, from white. So this is a good example. Um, although these players are unknown, the quality of play is, uh, is good as it emphasizes uh, the characteristic ideas of both sides. Black is attacking on the queen side as he should. And white is attacking on the king side and use, utilizing his space advantage. And also notice how the bishop pair has come alive here. These two bishops all lined up ready to uh, engage in the attack on the king side. Knight h7, good defense by um, black here. f4, there's the other pawn. g6, trying to slow the advance down. f5. Sacrificing, all right. G takes f5. Now here, I believe this is Black's uh, first error. It's kind of um, collapsing under stress here. Bishop takes f5 is better. Why? Because I'm following the simple idea that when you are under attack, that you should trade pieces. So, for example, if Bishop takes f5, Bishop takes yes, you would have the um, double pawns here, but at least there's uh, one less set of attacking pieces on the board. This is just a sample line, of course. Of course, this is exploit exploiting the pin on this diagonal here. Knight h6 check. Say king g7, queen h8, f6. And so on. Of course, improvements can be found, but having one less set of attacking pieces on the board benefits uh, black in its quest uh, for safety. So now let's go back to the game where bishop takes f5. I'm sorry, where bishop takes f5 was not played, but rather g takes f5. Now notice the bishop pair still remains intact. This bishop is weak. This is a bad bishop here. So it would be beneficial for the defensive player to get rid of this set of pieces. So what happened now was queen takes h5. Bishop takes c3. Notice again. Awkward situation now. Because if this pawn is out of the way. Queen is able to um, attack on h7. So knight g4. Again exploiting that very scenario that I just mentioned. Sorry for all the arrows. So you can see how things would have been a little better for black if the bishops, the light square bishops were traded off. Queen a7. White just continues with the attack. Queen g5 check. Good in-between move. King a7. E takes f6. Now mate is threatened. Queen takes d4 check. A little bit too late for that. King h1. And white has resigned, so you can see there's no um, uh, no stop uh, to mate without uh, losing uh, large sums of material. And we're going to rapidly move to our next game. Here's um, Alberico Kelly, one of the old school masters going against a player named Wood. In Barcelona 1946. We see a similar scenario here. And now, by this time... You should basically uh, start catching along. So here, uh, white, excuse me, black uh, adopts idea you would normally see in the French defense in some variations where um, black immediately tries to uh, solve the uh, problem of the C8 bishop becoming bad. So what he does is he trades off uh, white's major attacking piece. And again, this is idea also seen in the Kali system where you might see the bishop come out to f5 early on right the trade just to trade this bishop off because 
this is one of White's main attacking uh, pieces. So those pieces come off the board. Again, we see the same fight for e4, except the queen is gone. So, uh, excuse me, the bishop is gone. So now the queen takes over duty on the light squares. Notice how powerful this queen is on this diagonal and on this diagonal and also watching this square. Sorry about that. E4. C4. Again, C4 is played. This is better for white as white has already achieved E4. So now he uh, doesn't have to worry about the in exchange in the center. Rook E6 and E5. And now this is getting bad for black because there's no pressure on the E-file now. And white is simply able to roll up the king side. The counterplay comes way too late. A5. A takes. Queen takes. Right in the line of the queen. And black is just losing too much time here. Queen uh, d7, f5. Rook e a6. Uh, that's a big fantasy and dream to think that you're going to push this pawn successfully. Bishop a3. This uh, great diagonal for the bishop. It blocks the potentiality of this pawn going anywhere. But more importantly cuts off the escape square of the queen of the king here. A4, E6. What this does is create a wedge in the position so that it breaks Black's possibility of coordinating uh, pieces. So E6 and simply Queen C7. If um if F takes E6 here, F takes E6. Let's say um, Queen E6. Then there's simply Rook F8. And this just exploits, this variation exploits the uh, lack of coordination of the black pieces. The knight is on an awkward score on e8. And notice after the exchange, this move is uh, readily available. This is why after e6, the queen just had to move the c7. Rook b5 just attacking more stuff. And notice how play opens up on the other side of the board for white. Pawns just continue on and then just queen c1 and there's no stop to queen h6 follow. Um, well, not obviously not uh, here, but here in mate. <clears throat> if the knight moves, then mate on g7. This is a game between Evgeny uh, Kuzminka. With the white pieces and Alexander's Koblinks with the black pieces. And this is from the uh, Russian Championship Semifinals in 1950. You might know the name Koblinks because he was a uh, former world champion Tao's uh, trainer for a long time. He has the white pieces here. Again, we see this main line continuation. Again, early C4. And here we see a little twist in the scenario with G4. Again, the same idea, right? You're going for E4, right? And then eventually playing E5. That's a more positional approach, right? Uh, developing your pieces, getting into E4, um, and then going for the king side attack here. Uh, with this early C4, it kind of blocks the potentiality of this bishop. This bishop can't really get here. So you'll see sometimes it's more aggressive G4. Uh, idea with the attack early attack on the uh, king side knight g3 queen h4 and now bishop g2 so you can see the bishop couldn't get here so it goes here knight to d6 castle and f5 and now a4 with a similar uh, scenario. Can you tell where that uh, bishop on c1 is going? Rook e8. <clears throat> this is to put pressure on this pawn. And keep this bishop locked down for the moment. However. This knight is hanging. So it gives black uh, uh, a, l a little dilemma he must face. So he has to deal with that. So knight f7. And now queen d2. Knight h6. Queen f2, 
now g6 g takes g takes now knight e2 going into an end game and i wanted to show you this game because of course all games don't end in king side attacks however if you do end up in the end game in this variation it's often a good end game because you have a solid pawn structure you have usually have space and you have open files for your pieces and you also have the pair of bishops that you have obtained uh in the beginning because black gives up the pair of bishops um after you play a3 in this variation and you can see because of uh black's play earlier that he's uh created some weaknesses here although black uh has this uh e3 pawn to uh pile up on uh we could say that um black has a little bit more a uh, little more problems in the position as uh white's pieces are able to attack his weaknesses easier than the other way around and this bishop is bad also knight d7 and finally little tactical shot here bishop takes bishop takes and now bishop h3 bishop comes back trade rook h5 and again black's pieces are just uh uh too uncoordinated to really mount up a, a fight next game is between a young Jan Temin uh this is from the European under 18 championship versus uh gear uh Literink, 1967 so we see Temin uh with the white pieces again coming out in this main line here black decides not to give up the bishop here which to me is wise because you know with the knight being on e2 and there's no chance of the uh pawn structure being damaged uh there's really no reason to just give up the bishop here but white gets what he wants plays e4 and now it's up to black to prove that the white center is weak so after castles um white wins his pawn right but uh black wins the pawn rather but it's not uh all so simple queen b3 is played and now we can see uh this threat here against f7 and there's a trap here now in hindsight the move to play is to simply knight f6 and perhaps play could go bishop g5 right with the idea of doubling the pawns up and then bishop e7 and then the onus is on white to prove uh that he has enough compensation uh, for the pawn let's say after bishop c4 which kind of forces the rook back and then let's say rook a d1 so does does white have enough compensation for the pawn uh that's a good question um but this probably would have been Black's uh, best continuation here. I think he does. I think White does have enough compensation, but um, we won't know because Knight of Six wasn't played. Instead, Black played Knight takes C3, trading off pieces but leaving this spot open. Now, did he commit an oversight? No, of course not. Right? Now, obviously, he saw this move. What he did was he miscalculated the ramifications. So after queen takes f7 check, king h8, b takes e3, queen e7, right? Hey, just figure you have a nice even game. Even pawns, bishop pair, we'll shake hands, it will be a draw soon. However, Timmy finds a fantastic move here. He just simply plays queen h5 and threatening mate. Okay, and then there's all kind of uh, back rank issues here. So bishop e4. And now Timmy finds bishop g5. Very powerful move. And what is Timmy, uh, excuse me, what is uh, uh, Ligdering going to do? He plays queen, takes g5, which is tantamount to suicide. Queen takes g5, bishop d3, and queen e3, and uh, black had to resign. Of course, he can't take the rook because 
of the back rank situation. So he had he has to uh, resign there. This piece is attacked, and this piece is attacked. But going back here, if he tries to play queen d7, for example, just simply bishop takes e4 again, exploiting the back rank. He really has no um, no good moves here. Uh, if he goes queen e6, same thing. He has no good moves at the knight f4. And let's say queen c6 again, trying to, you know, keep the fight going. Then just again, bishop takes here. And then rook a1. So it ends bad. Uh, however you want to look at it. Rook takes e4 here. Is met by the powerful move knight. Uh, g6 check again. The check. Threatening mate here. This forces the king out. Because if he plays queen takes g6. Then of course rook takes f8. So the king is forced over. in the same... Same thing, rook takes, so there's no way out. So, um, really nice little trap um, there from Temin. But again, here, black should just play knight f6 and then see if white can generate enough, or white has to answer the question if he can generate enough activity to justify his play. This is a game between another uh, expert in this variation. Um, actually, I can't say another expert. This is one of the experts, modern experts in this variation of uh, Victor Moskalenko, who's rated 25-25, versus um, uh, Nukim uh, Ryszkowski, who's rated 25-40. This game took place in 1990. Again, D5, A3. And here, he decides not to give up the bishop here. You got to remember that, you know, as time goes on, people have different ideas, different um, uh, philosophies on how to approach uh, to b the position. Back in the olden days, if you notice, like when I was showing you the early games, as soon as A3 was played, people gave up the bishop pair like, okay, this is how you play the Nemzo Indian, right? We're giving up the bishop pair, uh, we're fighting for E4, etc. But as time goes on, people had different ideas and philosophies. And they try to approach the position differently. Here, however, when you don't give up the bishop here, this allows uh, White to implement his plan in a straightforward uh, manner. So e4 was played, c5. So this is uh, Black's idea. He's just going to counterattack in the center. And now d takes c5 here for White. Um, if knight g e2 here, the center becomes uh, fragile for White. So d takes, f takes. A castle, for instance, d5, e takes, c takes, rook e8. And, again, this the, the center uh, has to be maintained and, and becomes, um, you know, sort of a liability as the uh, pressure starts to build up from the uh, black pieces, right? As white has to still kind of figure out how to uh, develop. If C takes D5, D4, D5, excuse me, then C takes D4, and Queen takes D4. This is possible also uh, for White. This doesn't look too bad. However, he played D takes C5. After B takes B4 here, takes, takes D4, E5. And now we see the Queens come off the board. And again, this is an example of what I was saying. How even in the end games, white usually has good end games because again having the bishop here is great and the open files for the rooks. And in this case, he has black's compromised pawn structure, and you only can um, get the advantage to white in this position. So I'll just rapidly go through this. But white went on to win, just utilizing his space advantage and his bishop here and his active pieces. By the time black gets unraveled, white is already, you know, uh, far advanced up the board. And we can see the rapid deterioration in the black position. 
This next game is from Manila Interzonal, 1990. Walter Arensibia, 25-55 GM versus um, uh, Eric LeBron. Uh, uh, Grandmaster also 25-35. Here we see a return back to tradition, giving up the bishop here. Um, here, at the C takes D5, Knight takes D5, we see the um, that the pawn was not, um, uh, that black didn't capture with the pawn, which is usual. Knight takes D5 is possible, but it's, it's a little bit sharper in that you're attacking this pawn right away, but it also provokes this move, uh, E4, right? Because there's no pawn here to counterattack that. So, you're committing to... Like uh, this uh, modern game when you when you play in this manner without putting the pawn in the center. D takes, and now queen a five and e four. And now you might be saying, "What? Wait a minute! Can Black just capture that pawn? He can. Ninety seven, it was played. But if he plays queen takes c three, queen takes c three, this is bad for Black. After bishop d two, so you can see." The queen is attacked and the knight is attacked, so that's obvious. The move you want to analyze is knight takes c3. So if the knight takes c3, one obvious move is bishop d2, but then you just trade queens. So knight takes c3, queen uh, d2. All right, and now this this knight is pinned to the queen. Is black lost? No, but he gets in trouble here. And say knight c6. Now the queen is protected. This guy's threatening to get out of dodge. And now bishop b2. Again, the power of the bishop here cannot be uh, overemphasized. And we can see in this long uh, dark diagonal. This knight really can't uh, go anywhere. Right, without giving up this pawn. So usually what will happen here is a move like knight a4. Queen takes, knight takes, and then bishop g7. Say rook g8, bishop f6. And this is better for white. Better position. More space. Open files uh, for white to uh, use readily. And the bishop pair. It's a killer. Right? This is a good position. I don't think uh, many GMs will want to go in a position like this. This is why you see 97 being played here. Again, notice the space advantage of white in the position. Bishop e3. And notice, he doesn't care to, to try to hold this pawn or anything. So, for instance, if queen takes c3, just simply king f2. You're relying on your positional advantages at this point. The point is black. Uh, excuse me, as white. Sorry. So, bishop e3, castle was played, and now queen b3. Queen c7. Knight h3. Knight to f2. And I'll speed through this game. And I wanted to show you this game so you can see the positional aspects. Notice that white is not really playing on, on a, uh, for a king side attack here. Right, he's just playing positionally. Playing on the same side of the board as uh, is, uh, black for the most part. And now you can see only at the end he, transfer, he, tra he switches to a king side attack here. And nice, nice ending with the knight. I thought you could appreciate that. Black resigns as it's going to be mate in three. Here's one of the great Dutch defense players playing the white pieces. Vladimir P. Maliniuk versus the uh, same player um, we encountered before with the black pieces, uh, Ryszkowski. Again, we're just going to speed through this game. And here, Ryszkowski does not bother to uh, counterattack in the center with the pawns. Instead, he just brings his pieces out. He allows the big pawn center. And he plays a little bit uh, slower here. Now, he gives up his bishop here for nothing, which I think is... Um, of course, you can play it, but strategically, eh. You know, but it's one of those things that, you know, if you plan on... You know, you got a plan, an idea, I guess you can play it. Um... But it's too to me. It's too it's too early in the game to be so committal. That's why I don't like to give up the bishop here like that early, because now black has no counterpart to this dark square bishop, which can dominate. So all black can do really to counter that is put his pawns on dark squares. 
Yeah. Which he does. And we can already see the uh the king side attack. This almost looks like a king's Indian like a um but a old Indian defense uh for black. And we can see just this traditional uh play in the queen uh king side. Um White just gives white just gives up a pawn. These are the type of activities you see often in opposite wing castling situations as we see here is that it's more about the initiative than you know holding on to material. And we can see that uh Millenniac with the white pieces all is all over uh black hair. Files open up and you can already see the end is near. That was just a desperation move right there by black at Queen A four. To make it sure the position's open. And um after after this move, after King E eight, um Black just resigned. This game is gonna be over after say Queen takes B four, A takes and Rook G eight. Here. If Rook F seven then Bishop H five. And again, I'm showing you this variation because I want you to see the bishop here in effect. This is a major component in this opening uh, many times. Again, next game, 1992, Reykjavik, Alexei Shirov with the white pieces versus Helgi Olafsson. This is young Shirov too, so this is Mr. Fire on board here. And we can see here, um, Shirov opts to um, play uh, Queen D3 here. And he, he plays Queen D3 here because again, Black did not choose to play this move here. So instead, he's attacking right away. Okay, so here, in this particular variation, if he plays e4 here, then knight takes c3 is playable. There's really no way that uh, to exploit this, um, this move by Black. So for instance, I don't know if you try queen... Uh, queen b3 for instance and just simply c takes d4 protects the pawn so notice the difference in your your lines right with that pawn on c4, c5 like that um, he's able to um, to capture and protect the knight and so it's moves like this that black tries, tries to develop um, right as the analysis continues to flow you know and games are played little things like this little subtleties that uh you know where black is trying to throw monkey wrench in in the position because remember white just wants to play e4 bishop d3 knight g2 queen you know and just just run black over so queen d3 is played and now e4 knight e7 f4 so shirov is just going to get busy here queen c7 knight f3 and hey the onus is on black you must show that this this big center is uh nothing but uh um you know psyops operation it's not real right b6 queen e3 remember we saw this idea earlier of black wanting to get rid of white's most powerful piece okay but we can see a beautiful position here by black excuse me by white white is fully developed and ready to push those pawns forward so black has to come up with an antidote black plays f5 they try to slow things down a bit queen d3 knight c7 c4 the pawns just uh, keep coming and the problem here now is um with black excuse me with white um planning to play moves like d5 and, and possibly e5 but more so uh, d5 this forces black's hand so c takes d5 queen takes d5 but now this bishop's diagonal has been opened up again i keep emphasizing the bishops rook f7 this forces some passive this forces passivity out of black and knight g5 so now what got to give up the exchange knight c6 and queen just queen d3 here rook f f8 
Now just E takes F5 from Sheroff, Rook takes F5. Um, you might say, hey, why not uh, E takes? Problem with E takes F5, right? Maintaining a, a pawn structure uh, and looking like it's equal is that it just fails tactically to Queen D7. That's the problem here. You're threatening mate here, and you're threatening this uh, these pieces. So, um, how would you defend? You really can't play can't play rook f7. Um, rook e7 doesn't work. Now you just tell, you just capture. So this is why he has to take with the rook, and of course, simple moves work in chess. Knight e6. Now this rook is just um, protected all of a sudden. And so, Olafsson resigned. <clears throat> Here's another game from 1994 Moscow uh, Russian Championship Round 3. This is uh, Viktor Moskalenko again. One of the um, experts that you should follow if you want to learn this opening from the white side. Playing against none other than the young... Uh, Alexander Morozevich, who I think it was about 14 or 15 at the time, but he was 2590 already. Morozevich played this variation C5, which leads to Benoni uh, type positions, right? So he's attacking the center, but not directly in the classical sense with D5. Instead, he plays C5, all right, which of course has to be dealt with because the you know, the idea is real simple. C takes D4, Queen takes, Knight C6, gaining tempo. And you have these uh, Sicilian, Paulson Sicilian uh, type positions. So after D5, the position takes on like Benoni uh, type uh, flavor. And you can see Marozevich's aggressive play already at a young age here. So here things are a little different as White has already established uh, his control on E4. And here is just more of a consolidation here. And again, we have the same scenario where white is left with a bishop or a bishop pair. His open files to use. And black has some weakness in the position. And after bishop f4 provokes more reservists to play e5, uh, which he would have had to play anyway. So, for example, if he tried to delay things with say like rook a d8 well you just play rook fd1 you could still start piling up and eventually um you know something is gonna have to uh give here you have to play e5 at this point or queen c7 and then queen b3 and the pressure eventually will um cause a move like that so he plays it right away so e5 bishop g5 here and then Mar Marvazevich kind of outthinks himself, plays knight e8, which protects this pawn, but again, it, um, you know, creates some disharmony in the position. Moskalenko jumps on this immediately, exploiting this diagonal, queen b3, and, and now king h8. And this allows the game to end immediately. Can you find a move? I'm sure you did. Queen b7. Attacking the rook and knight. Again, this knight is blocking the coordination of the rooks. And Marvazevich uh, had to resign. There's no uh, no answer uh, to this um, loss of material right here. So 17 moves. This game is between Sergei Volkov with the white pieces and Sergei um, Makarichev. Um, with the black pieces. This is another player with the white pieces who is an expert in this variation, Sergei Volkov. This time he was only 2460. He was probably an international master at the time going against a grandmaster. To me, this is kind of like white's dream position where black plays like passively um, and just instead of playing like C5, he plays like this Slav type structure where he doesn't really put any pressure on the white position and kind of lets white do, uh, do what he wants. And you can see here that although he gets rid of some pieces, 
black white has a lot of leeway here and he just goes on and wins the game in the real simple uh manner with the queen c5 uh white just um black just uh resigned here you know he's just uh up a piece This last game I'll show you is um, uh, from a few years ago. I played in a, a game 60 uh, at the a, a 60 minute uh, tournament um, at the Marshall Chess Club. I had the white pieces uh, versus a player named uh, Ayuso, and uh, this is just to show you uh, this play. This player wasn't high a high rated player. This player was about 1600 or so. Um, but I just wanted to show you the use of the, you know, the general ideas and principles in uh, this opening and they show that you can apply them too. All right. So again, here we are. F3 and D5 classical approach. I immediately um, grabbed the bishop here. Castle, C takes D5, knight takes D5. And now we had uh, spoke about this already that uh, many times you'll see the move, um, E takes D5, which is perfectly fine. It's a, a matter of preference. But players that want to um, usually allow you to play E4 or um, uh, want to play more of a modern game, right? They don't want to commit their pawns in that way. They'll play Knight takes D5. Now here, in contrast to the other game I showed you, E4 is allowed. Now can you see why? The difference why E4 works here is because in the Shirov game, if you want, you could go back and look at that. But in the Shirov game, C5 was on board already. So therefore, Shirov had to play the move Queen D3 to keep C3 protected. Here, Knight takes C3 is not really um, is not really that that dangerous for White here. So, for example, if E4. Oh, I did play E4, but Knight takes E5. If I played E4. If knight takes c3, then I could just simply play queen b3. Now, if there's a pawn here as in the Shirov game, then he would just play here. But that pawn's not there. So now, basically, the only way that black can try to show some kind of compensation here is to sacrifice the piece for the pawns. Interesting line, but I don't know if you would want to go into something like that unprepared. So, for example, if queen d4, bishop b2, Black is pretty much busted here. The critical line is to play knight takes e4 and just get a bunch of pawns for the piece. And then you get a position like this. The idea of rook a2 is to play rook c2 uh, here and, uh, of course, complete your development. So, to me, white is, white is better here. Black doesn't have enough uh, compensation uh, here for the pawn. This is why at the E4, black just went back to E7. So you can see here that white has achieved his goals. White is, um, has a full, the full pawn center, the full gambit. The only thing black, uh, white has to do now is catch up in development. This is black's advantage. And black should be striving uh, to exploit his de uh, development lead. Because if white is allowed to catch up in development, right, the two bishops, the beautiful center, white is going to have the advantage. So immediately I get, get on it. Bishop d3, f5, and already black loses loses uh, the thread in the position um, and then playing f5. Because this is a move that I just, I don't even, I don't have to react to. Um, and I just played bishop e3 here. I could have played knight e2, of course. But bishop e3, knight bc6. Now knight e2. F takes, f takes. And the reason why I had played bishop e3 earlier, because I anticipated this exchange. And now what to do about castling. You play knight g6 first. And this is why I played bishop e3, so that I would have this move. Now this creates a bridge whereby I can castle. So queen g5, sorry about that. And now I castle, bishop d7. 
and queen c1 now offer exchange of queens why because of the reason I told you before I already know I have better pawn structure I have more space and I have the two bishops and I have open files on which to operate so I know the end games are going to be good for me and at the same time I am eliminating all danger of my opponent of uh, defeating me queen h5 of course he avoids that play queen d2 rook f7 and now bishop g3 attacking this uh, c7 pawn and here he loses uh, the thread in the position um, he doesn't want to play uh, passively with rook c8 so he decides to um, try to do something uh, tactical here and he plays e5 which immediately loses the bishop c4 as 90% of you can see bishop e8 and then I don't rush to capture the piece but I just build the pressure on a position queen g4 rook a f1 knight h8 and everything is just driven back slowly queen e3 e takes d4 c takes d4 knight e7 I'm stubborn I still don't uh trade rook e5 king f8 and now finally I decide to trade here bishop takes f7 knight takes f7 and just play queen f2, putting more pressure in a position. Queen g6, knight f4, hitting the queen. Queen f6, bishop h4, just throwing the kitchen sink at him. g5, desperation. I don't know if it's time trouble or what maybe occurred at the time, but anyway, nailing the coffin uh, after knight e6. Uh, and he resigned. So I just wanted to show you this game of me actually uh, playing against the opponent and utilizing the same principles that I've spoken about. Um, the F3 um, Ninja Indian is very simple um, and is very a very dangerous uh, weapon. There's two grand masters that you can follow as your role models: and Victor Moskalenko and um, And uh, Sergey Volkov uh, from the white side. And the plans are pretty much uh, straightforward. And I've covered all the basic variation that you would play um, in the game examples that I've given. Uh, for instance, you, sometimes your opponent's going to play d5 in exchange with the pawn in the center. Sometimes he's going to exchange with the piece in the center. Sometimes you're going to play c5, which is going to lead to uh, your Benoni uh, type positions but just remember your bishop here is very powerful your um, your center and your king side attack sometimes you wind up in the end game remember you usually have uh, good chances uh, at an end game uh, utilizing your two bishops and your space so anyway that was kind of a long video um, I hope you enjoyed it though nothing else to do right in this uh, uh, quarantine uh, Saturday uh, so it's a good time to learn uh, some chess or brush up on some chess so again people please uh, uh, be so kind to scroll down check those links below uh, hit the donate button and uh, also hit the thumbs up and I would like to hear your comments if there's any other opening systems that you want me to go through in this manner I can do that Alright, just let me know in the comments and I'll see you guys on the next video.